Hello, today I bring you a new video. Now, I want to try switching things up a little bit, so in my day life, I'm actually a scientist, so I thought let's apply the scientific method to some of these newer videos. So I thought what better way to start off than doing how to take a good Polaroid. Now I feel like to take a good Polaroid, you need the scientific method because there's so many factors that go into it. So we're gonna talk about those factors and we're gonna see how to make the best Polaroid possible. So before we talk about what makes a good Polaroid and how to make a good Polaroid, I feel like we should really talk about the history. So one of my pet peeves and what makes me wanna give you this history is that the Polaroid company now has a slogan, imperfectly perfect. And I think that's misleading because back in the original Polaroid era, the Polaroids you took were almost perfect. Like you took the photo and there was nothing wrong with it. It's almost how like the Instac is today, the Instac uh, film. So what happened was Polaroid, the original company, was founded in 1937 and they went bankrupt in 2008. The chemicals they used, the original chemicals they used for their film, either was banned at this time, or when Polaroid closed, the company that made the chemicals also closed because they made chemicals just exclusively for Polaroid. Then when Polaroid went bankrupt, there was a new company that came out called The Impossible Project. They started making the film and reviving the Polaroid name. Now the Impossible Project had to make different chemistry for their film. So that's kind of one of the, well, it's one of the reasons why the old fashioned Polaroids you had 10 in a pack and now you have eight in a pack because the chemistry they use now requires a thicker film. So since the film is thicker, you only could fit eight in the original cartridge that fits into the old Polaroid 600s. So, the chemistry is different, so there's a lot more factors now affect the, the film. So you had the Impossible Project, and now the Impossible Project rebranded to Polaroid Original. And then around 2020, the Polaroid Original then rebranded to just Polaroid. So that's what we have today. We have Polaroid, which is not the original Polaroid company, using different chemistry than the old Polaroid company. So that's the background. Hopefully that wasn't too confusing. So now that we talked about the background, let's discuss some of the factors that affect the Polaroid. So the first thing you should do is when you get your pack of Polaroids, you're gonna put it in the fridge. You're gonna put it in the fridge and that's where it stays because the chemistry in these new Polaroids need to be refrigerated and ideally you wanna shoot them a year after their production date and the production date will be right here on the foil or outside the box. So for mine, the production date was October 2024. Right now we're in December 2024. So this, I have a year to shoot, especially when it's refrigerated. So now you're gonna take the film out of your refrigerator and you're going to get it to room temperature and then place in your camera. Now the other factors that are very important is temperature how you handle the film, and light sensitivity, so how much light touches the film. Now, if it's too hot or too cold, when the film comes out, you're gonna have a color shift. If light touches your film, it's going to desaturate it and make it overexposed. So it has to be the perfect temperature, and you have to shield it from light while it develops. The development time for this film is about 15 minutes, which is definitely longer than the original film and longer than the Instax film. After the 15 minutes, it's safe to look at it, but I find that leaving it for a longer time, like maybe a day or two, that it fully gains its contrast, which we'll also look in this video. But all these factors you gotta look out for when taking the Polaroid, and as long as you get your composition right, and you follow these factors, you should have a good Polaroid. So for the video today, I'm gonna use a Polaroid one step close up. I'm just gonna give you a little tour of this uh, camera here just in case if this is what you're using, you can kinda get a grasp of uh, what we're talking about here. So here we have the Polaroid 600 close up. 
it's called close up because if you move this dial here, it's gonna put a lens here. And that lens will allow you to shoot anywhere from two to four feet. And then the regular lens will allow you to shoot anywhere from four feet to infinity. There's also an exposure compensation dial right in the middle. You could then, I don't know how many steps of exposure compensation it is, but you can make it over or underexposed or the correct exposure is right in the middle. There is two buttons on the side here. The big, bigger button causes the flash to go off and the little button just, just below the big button is how you take a picture without the flash. And then on the back here will be a green light when it's ready to shoot and the flash is ready to go. For by chance, if you have this open for a bit and the green light goes away, you could just half press this button and that will just recharge the flash. And you might be asking right now, well, how's the flash work? The flash works is there's a battery in the film pack that's gonna power this camera. So if you put a fresh film pack in, you're going to have power. To then load this camera, you're going to press this button on the side and it's gonna open up a door and then you're just gonna place the film in this door, close it, and then a film shield will come out. Just a little input on the film here. This film is 600 speed film. It is super hungry for light. So you're gonna find that this works really well outside on a sunny day and you're gonna have a lot of trouble indoors in dingy or dark lighting and that's when the flash is gonna come into play. But the flash could only do so much, so try to get as much light as possible. So again, it's a 600 film, and just make sure you get as much light as possible, because that's going to really help with the pictures. Now we're just going to take a deeper look at the factors and what is said to happen when these factors are not met. So like I said, if you don't shield your film when it first comes out, it's going to be overexposed and you're not going to have as much contrast. So you wanna put your film away into a drawer, somewhere dark. I usually put it in my back pocket. And then if you take the photo and it's somewhere too hot, you're gonna have less, uh, it's gonna be overexposed and you're gonna have a less color contrast and it's gonna be slightly red. Then if you put, uh, take a photo and it's too cold, it's gonna color shift the photo to the blues and purples. A little bonus information here is don't shake your Polaroids because this is going to mess up the chemistry and you're going to wind up distorting the photo or not causing the proper chemical reaction to occur within the film. So don't shake your photos. So we're going to apply the scientific method to four factors today. We're going to look at temperature. What is the temperature effect on the film after it comes out of the camera? We're going to look at the distance of the subject to the wall when we take our photo. So the camera to subject will be the same distance, but we're gonna change the distance from the subject to the wall. Because this is very important, because if you're in a dark area and you take a picture of the subject far from the wall, you're just gonna see a sub the subject and a dark background. If you put the subject close to a wall, you're gonna see the subject and the background. So we're gonna take a look at that. We're also gonna take a look at development time. So the film develops within 15 minutes. So we're going to see how the photo looks like in 15 minutes. And then we're going to do time intervals to see how the film looks over a couple hours to days and to see when the film really gains its full contrast. And then we're also going to look at the exposure compensation dial and how that affects your photos. So we're going to do over, under, and the nominal exposure. Okay, let's crack open the pack. So here we got the foil pack. Crack this open here. This is the cartridge. This is the film shield. It's gonna pop out right when you put it in. And this is just a little sticky tab that you're gonna pull when you're done with the cartridge once you use all eight exposures. And these are the battery connections. I'm gonna pop open the film door here. We're gonna take our cartridge. We're gonna slip it right in. And then we're gonna close the door. Then you take the film shield out, discard it, and now your camera's ready to go. We're going to start with our first experiment, and it's gonna be temperature. 
we're going to take three photos of the same subject at the same distance as close to the same time as we can and we're going to see how the film develops at room temperature, body temperature, and the cold. Can't really do the heat because it's the winter so we're just going to look at those three temperature factors and see how that affects the film. Alright so here we're at uh, my super exciting subject right here my bookshelf. We're going to shoot at about two feet away. So I'll shoot about two feet away and let's do it. So since I'm shooting two feet away I'm changing it to the microscopic uh, photography here for two to four feet and I'm just going to aim it right here. And we're going to take three photos in succession. All right, we're gonna get those into the three locations I was talking about. All right, so it's been 15 minutes and the temperature pictures are done. And I'm actually surprised by the results, I'm not gonna lie here. Let's just go through them, hopefully you guys can see them. We're gonna start with the cold. So this was at 37 degrees, so that's about the temperature it is outside. So if I was to take this picture outside, it looked like this. So obviously you see the blue shift. This photo was put into the drawer and it was 66. I put the temperature on the back. So this was at 66 degrees. There is actually a slight blue shift in this photo, which was actually surprising. Now, I always put my Polaroids in my back pocket, but this is my back pocket, which was 82 degrees. You can see there's no color shift and it, the contrast is pretty good. So back pocket for the win. So I guess from this experiment, what we learned is when you take a Polaroid, put in your back pocket, body warm, is uh, something the film likes. So there you have it for temperature. For this experiment, we're going to do the distance from the subject to the wall. Now we're going to keep the distance from the camera to the subject constant and that's going to be four and a half feet. I chose that because the lens is good from four feet to infinity. So I did four feet and just added a half foot for insurance to make sure it's in focus. And then the subject is going to be away from the wall. We're going to do two distances. One is going to be a foot from the wall. And then the next one is going to be five feet from the wall. And we're just gonna see the difference of how the flash can handle the distance from subject to the wall. We got a little change of plans here. I don't have a human subject to test for the subject and wall distance. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take a picture of my guitars on the wall, and that's gonna be the picture for the subject to wall closeness. And then I'm gonna take the guitar and put it on my office chair and bring it away from the wall, and that would just be the picture of subject far away from the wall. I'm gonna get my tape measure, we're just gonna measure what the background's gonna be. All right, I'm back. The guitars are about three inches from the wall, so that will be the closeness picture. So <coughs> this is four feet from the wall, and I'm gonna take a picture over here, which is four feet, which is the same distance I did for the guitars on the wall. Now let me tell you, I wish I knew the information of the temperature test before I did the other test because I would have done body heat for all of them, but we did do room temperature for all of them. So we're going to look at the photos I took of the background separation. So here is the guitars on the wall that are three inches from the wall. Again, I'm going to show the pictures and the background, super bright and the subject is darker, but there's good contrast between uh, the foreground and background. This is the guitar, sadly, in the chair because I lost the uh, model I was supposed to do. But this is the guitar in the chair. And you can see from the picture that the background is beginning to look black or dark. And I'm also gonna throw up another picture that I took at a holiday party. And it just shows that when the subject is away from the background, you're going to have almost a completely back, black background. And this photo here was only 
uh, four feet from the wall. So any, I would say anything four feet or greater from the wall, you're gonna have almost a black background. So try, if you wanna get the background in, in a dark area, try to have a subject four feet or less from the wall. But if you do want the black background, four feet or more. For this experiment, we're going to look at the exposure compensation dial. So we're going to take a picture of the same subject at the same distance with the same camera, same lighting, again, as close to the same time as possible. And we're going to take it at the nominal exposure. We're going to take it at overexposed and underexposed and just compare the pictures and see how the dial affects the pictures. So I'm actually going to take a picture of this scene for the exposure compensation because you have this bright light source in this kind of dark area here. So we're going to see what it would look like if it was over, under, and normally exposed with this scene right here. The exposure compensation pictures are done. They were developed at room temperature. I didn't do an underexposure because it just wouldn't have made sense if I was trying to expose for the shadows. So here are the results. This is the normal exposed photo. And this is the overexposed photo. I'll show them up side by side in a picture later. But from uh, my initial views is that the properly exposed photo came out the best and the overexposed photo blew out the highlights of the lamp. But did get some detail on the Amazon show that was there that was all black because we just lifted the black, uh, the light in the blacks but then we lost and clipped out the highlights. For this experiment, we're just going to take a picture and we're just going to track its development time. We're going to look at it at the 15 minutes is when it's supposed to be developed. We're then going to look at it after one hour, and then we're going to look at it again after three hours, and then we're going to look at it after 24 hours, and then finally we're going to look at, at it after two days. And then we're just going to see the development time and record when the maximum contrast is present and when you know the film is fully developed. This is the result after 15 minutes, and then this is the result after one hour, and this is the result after three hours. And at this point, it stayed pretty consistent. The one day looked a little bit better, but after that, there was no change, so I didn't take a picture of the second day. So in conclusion, after about three hours, you have the full amount of contrast, and in a day, you get the maximum amount of contrast. So I hope you enjoyed the experiments and you're were able to see what factors affect the Polaroid, how it develops, and if you get your composition right, you follow what we found here, I think you're going to take great Polaroid photos and you just keep them in mind every time you take a photo. And I really hope your photos come out perfect after watching this video. Anyway, have a good day and thanks for watching.